Welcome to Northline. Great to have you with us today. We are going to talk about the Enneagram. We're leaning in today. We're going to talk about the type one of the Enneagram. And I know a lot of you uh, probably uh, understand what your type is. If not, we got you covered. No worries at all. Glad to have you uh, here as we, as we continue in this series. What we're doing is last week we kicked off kind of an intro about this soul search we're going on. So uh, what we're do, uh, what we're we're going to look at is, is how do we join the psalmist? Psalm 139, David says this, search my heart, O God, see if there be any wicked way in me, and then lead me to the right path. And that's our desire. That's where we want to go. And, and so it's kind of scary work to look at our soul. And so we're using this as tool, the Enneagram we'll be talking about. Um, and we're going to look at different portions of scripture every week, uh, because uh, there's nine different uh, really categories categories of how we tend to sin, nine different categories of how we tend to look at life. And, and so we'll be using those tools. But to catch us up to speed, one, I want to welcome those joining us online and our Joplin campus as well. But I want to take a moment and I want to uh, uh, quickly uh, what you missed on last week's Netflix episode. Okay, so, so, so here we go. First thing we can write down is this, the depth of my sin is too powerful for me to fix. I want that to be a baseline understanding for us that there is no self-help book you could hand me that can fix the, fix the issues that I'm dealing with, right? There is no podcast you can give me that would solve everything. This isn't just some psychobabble you can give. I love all of those tools. I'm all excited about it. But the depth of my sin is so deep that this is more than I can handle. This is more than a guru can help me out of. This is something that's gonna take a spiritual solution because my sin's a spiritual problem. I didn't get there naturally, I got there spiritually. And it says in scripture, all of us have sinned. Now, here's the deal. As we look at the nine different categories of ways of living life and perspectives and whatnot, and also some of our dysfunctions that could be uh, uh, arranged in these nine different categories, here's what you're gonna discover, I know I have. I am able to sin each of these nine ways. I am good at it. I, I, I could do like a sin buffet. I could take a little of this, a little of that. I, I, I know how to do it and all that. However, we all major in one of these areas, okay? This, this, this depth is too big. Second thing, though, this is the good news, is the depth of God's grace is too powerful for sin to stop. And some of you know that to be true as your own story. You, man, you were creative in how much you ran from God. And, and how long and, and how, and, and the things you did, you were running from you and from your dreams and your future and your family. And God took you right out of the middle of your mess and he put your feet on a solid rock because God goes deeper than our sin. That's the good news. So if you're on your journey and you stumbled in here today and you're on your journey away from God is, oh, I just... I'm just warning you, God's not as far away as you think he is because he's doing a deep dive after us and he's reaching us. His grace goes deeper. And then let's talk about this Enneagram tool as we go forward. The Enneagram tool, it's not a tool for self-help. It's an invitation for God's transformational power. And last week we spent a lot of time on this, that it's not just a tool for self-help. However, a lot of people use it as a tool for self-help. It's great. It's fascinating. Oh, is it a fun parlor game? You can use this as a great tool and a great uh, just observation of humanity. But please don't stop there. The Enneagram was a tool designed by the spiritual desert fathers in the third, fourth, fifth centuries AD to be able to get a window to the soul. Pope Gregory developed uh, the list of the seven deadly sins that the Catholic Church adopted and the Church Universal adopted for a long time, the cardinal sins, the seven deadly sins. And the Enneagram uses those seven sins and adds fear and deceit. So it makes it nine, nine sins that you could almost categorize any type of sin as to one of these ways. And it is a tool to say this. We all naturally have some fruit that grows off of our tree, right? And some of the fruit we're not proud of. We're like, ooh, grew anger. Uh, some of the fruit in my life is bitterness, insecurity. I could grow all these fruit that I'm not proud of. And so I could get a book and I could help manicure my tree and be like, okay, look at I, I don't have this bad fruit anymore. But it's deeper than that. You have to pick up the shovel and dig deep and go to the root of the problem. The root is, is the invitation to say, Spirit of the living God, when you transform the root in my life, 
The fruit will take care of itself. The fruit is just a byproduct of what's going on below the surface. So as we go into this journey, let's invite the spirit of the living God to mess with us and, and to change, to transform the root. And it, it wouldn't shock me if you start growing different fruit in your life. Some of these things that we talk about are typical if you lean towards these, this area of your personality and some of even the dysfunction of it. As we invite the spirit of the living God, it's not trying to manage that stuff. He transforms that stuff. And we start growing something more healthy. So uh, we're going to dive in. We're going to start with uh, Enneagram 1 is the perfectionist. Let me give you a few uh, descriptions of it. Uh, just for those of you who might not know what type you're at, let me describe the one. We'll do that every week, okay? So, so starting with the one this week, uh, you know you might be a one if there's a correct way to squeeze a toothpaste. You know you might be a one if there's a correct way to load the dishwasher and even unload the dishwasher. Um, if you don't know if you're a one, on your way home today, Day, sit in the passenger seat and try and be quiet when they drive, okay? Um, that's a foolproof test um, that you're a one. You're pumping the imaginary brakes. You know you're a one if you are like a life consultant, but no one pays you and you offer your advice for free to anyone who will listen because you don't wait for an invitation. You don't wait for them to have a ticket. You are just sputtering your advice anywhere and everywhere. You know you're a one if you're the only responsible adult in the room often. You know you're a one if you look around and some of you are like right here, like, yes, well, it's North Point, at least weigh that, okay? Bottom line is this, is you know you're a one if you look around and you're like, most adults are idiots, right? You're the one. Um, and, and you know you're a one if, if you, you know you work harder than most people, right? And you don't understand why they don't work as hard as you. You know you're a one if you have developed an efficient way to get everything done. You know you're a one if your closet is coded in any way, color-coded, uh, seasonal coded, organized in some fashion. You know you're a one if you work harder on projects than the other schmucks around you and it takes you longer to turn it in because it's never quite perfect. And when you finally do turn it in, someone says, wow, that's darn good work. And you think they're just being nice. You know you're a one if, if when someone's critical of you, you can even right now me saying it, you're picturing someone who is mean to you because criticism is really tough to accept. You know you're a one if you were the type of kid growing up, you didn't need a whole lot of guidance. You were the teacher's pet. You could comply to rules. You know you're the one if you say, just tell me how it gets done and I'll get it done that way. You know you're a one if you've ever put an Ikea piece of furniture together on the first try. You know you're a one on all these things. So let me walk through some one tendencies here. The motivation for the one is they want to do what's right. By the way, this is a gift from God. They want to do what's right. Isn't that every parent's dream of your kid to want to do what's right? Isn't that every substitute teacher's prayer of their students that they want to do what's right? I am not a one, by the way, okay? Um, is that's the motivation. And, but here's the fear. The fear is being wrong. And, and here's the flaw with that fear. We all are wrong. So what do you do when your biggest fear in life is being wrong? And it doesn't come from pride. It comes from a commitment to do right and to be right. And if you're wrong, now you have to really backtrack. You're like, how did I get wrong? Because I was sure I was right. I was sure everyone else was wrong. And, and they, they doubt if they're wrong. Uh, the danger for a one is doing the right things for the wrong reasons. Doing the right things for the wrong reasons. What's scary is this. You can be a phenomenal family member, a phenomenal spouse, and you know how to play by the rules, but it might not be driven by a passion and a love. It might be driven by commitment, and it doesn't have as much staying power. When it snaps, it snaps quickly. <laughs> you, you can do this spiritually too. You can be like, man, you're, you're doing all the rules. You're like the ref. You, you understand what's right. Nothing's, nothing's gray for you. It's black or white. And you're like, Shh, okay, that's wrong. I can see everyone else where they're wrong. And, and so what happens is, is all of a sudden I realize that, man, I'm doing the right things, but why do I feel so empty? And the vice for the one is anger. The vice is anger that has a short fuse. And I'll tell you, anger, they say in psychology, is a secondary emotion. And anytime you're angry, you got to dig just a touch deeper because you got to feel, what, what, what am I really feeling that triggers anger? Because anger is triggered. And a lot of times it's insecurity. 
or inferiority. When my drive is to be right and I don't feel like I am right, I don't feel like I'm good enough, now I get very angry at those around me. So we're going to look at this idea of one. Now, uh, we have a couple resources available. One is on January 28th, January 30th, and one's at the Springfield campus on a Monday night. One's at the Nixa campus on a Wednesday night. And I'd encourage you, make the drive. Uh, come out one of those nights from 7 o'clock to 8.30. It's going to be the same at both uh, campuses. Um, but uh, my therapist, Dr. David Swift, is going to uh, be talking about the Enneagram, and he's going to present it. And we're offering this as a free uh, a value for you all. And we want to encourage you, anyone who you know in your life who might be interested, I think it's going to be a, a major help for us. Us. Well, so we had him come in earlier uh, this last week, and we brought all of our staff together that had different numbers of the Enneagram. So we had a full table of different one through nine, and we had him do just like this group therapy, and we videoed it. It's just a great psychology experiment. Um, but we pulled out some clips of what it's kind of like to be a one. Check this out. Who's our one? Okay, so we met today, right? You're a one perfect childhood. Parents didn't have to discipline you. Parents didn't, you were auto, you were on autopilot all the way through your, your youth, weren't I you? I remember getting spanked once. Yeah. What'd you do? <laughs> My skateboard went into the middle of the road and I knew I wasn't supposed to go in the road. And I went to the road to get my skateboard. And as I was getting the skateboard in the middle of the road, my father's blue cutlass came around the corner and caught me. <laughs> Great timing. So I'm June, and I'm a one. I am a perfectionist. I actually like the other definition of being a good person better than perfectionist, because perfectionist sometimes comes with a negative uh, annotation to it. I strive to be right and accurate. That's why I was an accounting major in school, I, or I wanted to be a math teacher or something to that effect. Uh, so accuracy is very important to me. Um, and I also like justice uh, for people. And while the eight might be aggressive, I will get angry. But you might not know that I'm angry because a lot of times I will internalize it as well. I misunderstood because I, I want things to be right. I want things to be accurate. I want to help other people get things right. Sure. I don't want yeah. people to make the same mistakes that I've made. So I'm, I'm, if you ask my children, they probably found me to be angry a lot or judgmental in, in how they did things. Yeah, and that, that's, that's kind of the downfall of working so hard to get things right. Your vision, the one's vision, is very clear. It's very moral, and it's very black and white. And, and it's not very many other profiles that work in that window. The ones will have a tendency to be interpreted, misinterpreted, okay, as moralistic, as um, judging, right? And so you've been accused of that, I guess, mm -hmm. a couple of times, yeah. So, so, but it's not that way. And that's the beauty of this, is that if people can understand that June's approach to them is not about you being wrong, it's about this being right. And boy, you wanna, you wanna, put, a, you wanna put a one in a tough situation, put them in a new job that doesn't have a policies and procedures book. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All Brad. we had was ten commandments. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't enough. So life is a one. You know what's interesting about a one is a lot of times they don't have what we would call in the church world a good testimony. I don't know if you're familiar with that that term. It basically means change life story. Um, because the ones, by just default, they gravitate towards doing the right thing. And so, like. You, they don't resonate necessarily when someone's like, yeah, I've been hooked on heroin since I was six and a half, right? And, and every morning I like pour my Captain, you know, crunch cereal with vodka all over it. And, you know, I've been in and out of jail like 17 times last year. And, and all these things. And the one's just like, that's, that's wrong. Okay, you shouldn't do that. Like the worst thing a one did is like, you know, they, you know, they might have cut the tag off a pillow once. It says not to be removed under penalty of law. They're like, bad boy, bad boy. What you going to do? Right? <laughs> I'm crazy. You know, um, I drink too much coffee and it's bad. I know I shouldn't, you know, it's different things, right? So, so, so a one's not going to be good that way. Here's the challenge though. Even though it's good and the goal is not, hey, let's all go uh, live it up crazy and do 
things that are harmful. That's not the goal. But here's the challenge of the one, is often if a one does everything right, but then doesn't feel like they're enough, that'll mess with you spiritually. Some of you grew up in that kind of church environment. It's all about the rules, all about the rules. And, and everyone's, that's, that's wrong, that's wrong. You can't dance, you can't go to prom. That was an illegal use of hands. All these things, and you're just like, I don't know how to live. And you're always like scared that you're probably gonna die on a car accident on the way home and you're going to hell. And, and you live as this neurotic, is this enough? What do I gotta do? And then so maybe you're like, I didn't even watch a rated R movie until The Passion for the Christ came out. I didn't even listen to any like cool songs, you know, because it was evil. I didn't do any of these things and I still don't feel enough. Duh. That's why people walk away. And that's what brings anger. Because what happens is you start looking around and you're like, what? I've been faithful in my marriage and look at them. I know what they've been doing and they still are happy and look at where they're going on vacation. It's like, like, you know, like rarely do you look at everyone else's social media and you're like, ah, I'm just so content, okay? It's like toxin. And the ones can build this up and be like, look at what you're doing. God, how is that fair? Fair. Ones are incredibly fair. Here's the challenge. You've heard the term, life isn't fair. Doesn't that just tick you off if you're a one? Like if you're someone like the rest of us, you're like, whew, that's good. <laughs> Glad life ain't fair. But if you're a one, you're like, I wish it were. Matter of fact, I wish God graded on a curve. Because if God graded on a curve, all I got to do is look around. <laughs> I feel pretty good. The rest of us, we're like, ah, I like the whole grace thing. <laughs> that God loves all of us and gives us all. Here's the challenge. When we start to compare with everyone else, it robs you. Comparison is the thief of joy. And, and it's that way because you lose your gratitude. And when you lose your gratitude, now this amazing gift that you have of truth and bringing order to a chaotic world is all of a sudden now it's laced with bitterness and judgment. And it's a short fuse. And now people who are in need of grace, you're aware it's undeserving. But friends, can I remind us that by definition, every distribution of grace is undeserved. Is it not? It's not fair. The most unfair thing ever is that a good and perfect God would love us while I was still a sinner and die for me, the just dying for the unjust. So as a one, I need to respond, receive this. Because here's the problem. When I minimize the grace that I need, I always minimize the grace I've received. If I could find enough people who don't do life as good as me, then I feel like they need more grace than me. And when I don't feel like I need as much grace, I feel like maybe Jesus did me a solid, but he's kind of lucky to have me. As a church, <laughs> I'm not necessarily saying North Point, but as a church as a whole, the church has done a great job of putting on the referee jersey. <whistles> Saying, you're wrong. We got the truth. Everybody's welcome to hear our truth. Even if you don't want it, we'll come out and tell you our truth. And the scripture's true. <laughs> but the way we distribute it when it's robbed of grace is judgmental is about as effective as what you've heard horror stories of people yelling at people and telling them how quick they're going to go to hell. Let's not be like that. So I want to go to a story in scripture. We're going to look at Paul in scripture. And I know that Paul didn't take the Enneagram test. I have no visions of that or like that I can go in the court of law and say, here's what Paul's Enneagram number was. We don't know. But what I do want to do is I want to show a couple of glimpses of Paul's life and how he reacted that I think would make him a poster child for some of the ways ones might react, right? And, and I'm not a one. Uh, is, uh, I, don't, I don't understand the one real well. I, as, is my daughter's a one. And, and what this helps me is to help parent better because when we play in a tennis tournament, I just want to win, right? And so we play in a doubles tournament and, and like, I'm just like, no, don't do this. It, that's not how you hit a backhand. Come on, fix this, fix this, fix this the whole time. And we win and they give us medals and I'm like, we won. And she's crying. She's like, 
why do you think my backhand's bad? I'm like, what? Okay, so, so, so the thing is, is, is we, we have to understand these things, okay? Well, Paul represents some of this stuff. So Paul is this guy, it says in Scripture that he was, he, he was man, he, he, he nailed the law. He was a Jew in a Jewish culture. And so in this day, he did everything right. And so he was obeying the law. As a matter of fact, the Jews in those days, God had given 10 laws. The Jews made them 500 laws to make sure you don't break the original 10 laws. Okay? That's a one of mentality is, well, you know, like, let's put all these different barriers around this electric fence so that way no one touches the fence. And let's make these fences electric so that way they don't get electrocuted by the electric fence. Brilliant. Okay, so, so, the, so they do all this, 500 laws, and the Jews would obey all of them. Well, Paul was such a Navy SEAL Jewish guy that, that he was the elite of the elite, and so he was leading this whole squadron of religious people. They put on their referee jerseys. They would go around town, and if someone did anything wrong, they'd be like, that's wrong. You're doing it wrong. Our, our manuals say to do it this way. He was the Dwight Schrute of early first century. And so what happened is as he's going out, Jesus comes down. And he messed with the Jews' minds and the Pharisees. The Pharisees are religious leaders of those days. And they would be like, he would heal a guy. And everyone else would be like, yeah, that's awesome. And they'd be like, it's Saturday. You can't heal people on Saturday. Look at code 4876, okay? You can't do that. And he's like, guys, chill out, all right? Swallow the whistle. Let everyone play. Uh, you, you, we don't serve the law. The law serves us. What are you guys doing? And then Jesus says, you guys made 10 laws and made them 500. How about I take your 10 laws and make them two? Love God, love others. Booyah. And the Pharisees are like, blah, 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 blah. you cannot do that. <laughs> so they're the ones that made sure that Jesus got killed on a tree. <coughs> Think about that. This is the most dysfunctional way this group of ones could think. You're not, why? Because you're not doing it right. And look at the kind of people you're accepting. You're not even paying attention to what I'm doing. Short fuse. Then Jesus dies, rises again, ascends to heaven. And now all of a sudden there's these followers that are popping up everywhere. They call them these people of the way that we now call Christians. And so Paul rounds up all of his ref jerseys. I mean, they sold out at Johnny Max. I mean, they're just all out, and they're rounding up all these followers of the way. We found one. Acts chapter 7 tells the story of Stephen. He got stoned. Not the crazy way on a Friday, but the dead way, like forever. <laughs> and Paul's the one that authorized it. Paul's like, okay, it says he sat there, the cloaks go on his feet as they all like, because you don't want to throw with a heavy jacket on, you can't really zing them. And so, so, so they, they take their cloaks off, they lay them on his feet because he's in charge and he authorizes their death. In Acts chapter nine, they describe Paul this way. Paul was walking around breathing out murderous threats against the followers of the way. Breathing out murderous threats. Like, bro, why? Someone just needs a hug, man. You are a little uptight. Because if this is true, I've been doing this for years. And you're saying I'm wrong. So then Paul one day, in Acts chapter 9, he's riding his horse to Damascus. <laughs> Come on, I worked on that forever. Anyway, so, so he's riding his horse. All of a sudden, a bright light, phew, knocks him onto the ground. Literally knocked off his high horse. This arrogant man. <laughs> and check out what happens. It says he's instantly blinded. Is God not the funniest ever? How do you make a one crazy? Make him totally dependent on everybody else around them. You take out the very thing that they're using to judge others. <laughs> Now, um, someone help me out just a touch. For three days, he's blind. And then God does something inside of Paul that now he takes this bent up, frustrated one and from Acts chapter nine on till the end of the Bible, he becomes the best distributor of the best news ever. He takes this gift from God to bring order to chaos, to bring justice to brokenness. And he takes this good news and dripping with grace and love, 
now changes the world. So the key for us as a church, drip with grace and love. That's cute that you know the truth. But no one gives a flying flip if it's not dripping with grace. And one's are nervous I just said that. Just chill. Okay, just chill. <laughs> Is, so anyway, let's, let's look at what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3. Which side note, again, by the way, Paul's writing this not from the confines of his organized office. From a prison cell. No control. And you know what the whole theme of the book of Philippians is? Joy. You know that that was a supernatural transformation, not just some cool book you read. Like, I'm a one with some weird one dysfunctions. Let me read a book, and now I could be in prison, totally out of my control, and write on joy. Uh uh-uh, uh, uh uh. There ain't no seminar for that. That is Spirit of God transformation. Here's what he writes about that moment of tension and angst he had towards humanity. Philippians chapter uh, 3 says this. <laughs> if, if someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as uh, for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, underline this next word, faultless. Which, by the way, that was a big deal. Like, all these new people were hearing about Jesus, and they weren't Jewish people. Well, Jewish people just had a custom and culture. They were circumcised on the eighth day. Well, that was a Jewish thing. It wasn't like a... Uh, like a, uh, something that would happen over in, in Rome, you know, if you weren't a Jew. And so like all these new people who were like 30s and 40s coming to faith in Christ, these new church people are like, cool, let's see if you're serious. Circumcision service right here. You really want to follow Jesus? I see that hand. They're like, that was not my hand. Okay, they're like, that's not me. How about baptism? That'd be a lot better. How about a secret handshake? They were like, can we come up with anything other than circumcision? And that was like uh, Acts chapter 15 talks about, that's a whole chapter in the Bible about like, hey guys, is it? Because the, the ones were like, okay, no, no, that needs to happen. And they're like, ah, can we look over it again? Okay, let's just come up with something else. And they did, okay? But that's like, so Paul's like, listen guys, I was the man, okay? I, I had everything going, everything you want. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. Look at this next sentence. I consider them garbage, circle the word garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Ugh, that's tough for a one to say. I'm not standing in front of you because of my righteousness that comes from the law. I'm not here and authorized because I did everything the right way. It's better than that, Paul says. He says, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Paul says, I did everything right and I was missing something. And then I experienced Jesus and I take all those good things I did and I consider them garbage. And if you have a different Bible translation or version, it might say rubbish, which is not a word I use a lot. It is an English word and I realize I don't speak English. I speak American. And if you think you speak English, just watch a British movie and you'll realize, nah, I think I speak American. Okay, and so, so the word rubbish, okay, cute, that's awesome. Um, another word, oh, it gets really scandalous, is dung. Some versions translate that, I do count them, but dung, very polite word to talk about. Manure. The Greek word that Paul used wasn't rubbish, garbage, or dung. It was a Greek word called skubala. Scuba is only used one time in the entirety of the Bible. Philippians 3.8. Scuba was the most vulgar way to communicate the word manure. Scuba happens, my friends. That's what I'm trying to say. And everyone is wondering if I'm going to say that. <laughs> A big steaming pile of Scubala is right there. And got Paul saying, that's what all my efforts were. For a one to say that, for someone who never was inappropriate all his life to say, hey guys, look at all these things that I did. It's this. 
he's learned that there's something more important than doing right. It's speaking the truth with grace, and he changed the world. So here's what I want to do. I want to I look at one more verse in Scripture and then a couple of prescription. And this, is, this comes from the church end. There's a church uh, in Ephesus, and, and we see in the book of Revelation, there's seven different letters from God's spirit written to churches. It was kind of like a, uh, a performance evaluation of the churches. <laughs> so if you got this letter, you're kind of nervous to read it, right, in front of your congregation. One of the letters goes to the church of Ephesus, and it says this. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. Deeds, hard work, perseverance. You're like, thanks for noticing. That's cool. We like them too. He says, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. Okay. Yeah, well, thank you. We just, you know, we got, we got the book. We're just trying to live by it. He says that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have you found them false. You've persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. So far, I'm digging that letter if I'm the pastor of that church. I'm like, this is a letter of recommendation, isn't it? You are nominating us for something special. But then he continues. Yet I hold this against you. You've forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen and circle this next word. <sighs> repent. You know how hard it is for a one to repent? To say I'm wrong? Repent and do the things you did at first. If you don't repent, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Real quick context that makes this verse even jump more alive to me. He's writing to the church at Ephesus, which started in Acts chapter 19, I believe. How the church started is Paul preached and all these people were doing crazy pagan worship. Um, they, were, uh, they, they had all these sorcery items and, and fortune telling, and they took all of these things that were mystical, and they burned them in this big revival meeting. And that's how the church started. They were like, we are wrong. Burn it publicly. All this stuff, thousands and thousands of dollars of stuff in today's terms. And they burn it. And the church started with this really weird, raw, authentic confession. And over the decades, they put on their jerseys and realized, well, we were kind of wrong, but these people are really wrong. And the Spirit of God says, remember how you started Remember what got you into this? Paul says this to the Galatian church. Who has bewitched you? Who has cursed you? That beginning something in the spirit, now you're trying to do it based on good deeds? Because here's the deal. Too many times, the longer you've been living for Jesus, you can replace your hunger for him with holiness for him. And don't do that. You can trade compassion for others to comparison with others. You can trade um, a passion for Jesus for a performance for Jesus. And you can do the right things for the wrong reasons. And then you're just left hoping he grades you on a curve. But he says, repent. Let passion drive you. And when you as a one could see the justice of the world but not have bitterness towards the world because of it, but you're like, that was me. Instead of throwing a flag, I can throw you a life ring. Three things I would say for the one. First thing is this. Relax. Relax. Seriously. Today, when you go home, do something totally unproductive. Uh, just, just go and watch a movie. Um, watch the Chiefs, okay? Is, is, that might not help you relax, but Relax. Don't, don't even clean your room tomorrow. Don't. Seriously, just be like, oh, look at that mess. That's kind of how I am. It's, tomorrow, one, especially if you're following Jesus, oh, you've got a Bible reading plan. You have got it every day. Tomorrow, don't even do that. Just stare out your window and look at God's creation. <laughs> You'll be like, sorry, God, I haven't read yet. Just Relax. Second thing is this, receive, receive. Once you do so much for everyone, you really are the hardest working person. Receive from God. What do I require of you, he says in, in Malachi? I want you to love justice, love mercy, 
and walk humbly. I can only walk humbly if I'm doing those two things when I'm receiving the grace of God in my life. Every day, relax, receive. God loves you, not just for what you do. He loves you. If you parent a one, you're married to a one, you work with a one, words of affirmation are their thing. Give it to them. And not like, you do a good job. Say something about them. And ones, this is not easy for you. It will mess with you. Write a letter to you from God. You're like, I don't think I'm, yeah, you're allowed. Because he already talks about you in scripture. Dear Jeremy, I love you. I'm so proud of you. And put it on your mirror and read it every day. Start your day with words of affirmation from God. Receive. The third thing is this, refocus. No more comparison, no comparison. The gift that you have of being bent towards the rules, that's unique. Most of us, we're not that way, okay? Help us see it in a way that helps us change. Help us bring order and cha- uh, to the chaos. Help us bring function to the dysfunction. And when you do it with grace, that's the fragrance of heaven. Take the cue from Jesus. He could have been like, wrong, 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 idiots. Instead, he who knew no sin became sin for us. It was so attractive. Let's live that way. So two more things is this. I'm, no, I'm, I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect. This is the one's new mantra. But I'm loved perfectly. God loves you perfectly, even though you're not perfect. And last thing is this. I'm not loved because I'm valuable. <laughs> I'm valuable because I'm loved. And there is a world of difference between those two things. God loves you. By the way, you are valuable. But you're not loved because you're valuable. You're valuable to God because you're already loved. There is nothing you can do to increase your value or decrease your value. And you know what? That's good news to eight of the nine of us. But to the one, that's tough. Let me show you this picture as as I wrap up. There's a little girl who's sick with this teddy bear. If you were to rip that teddy bear out of her arms and wrap it up and give it to me for my birthday, and it's got a missing eye, some stuff in it, sticking out the side, smells like that hospital, I'd be like, "Mm, no, thank you. That would bring no value to me, would bring no value on eBay. It's not valuable. Therefore, I do not love it. But you ask that girl how valuable that bear is. In that moment, whatever she's going through, it's the world. It's valuable because it's loved. Ones, you are that bear. You are in the arms of God. And he loves you. And it's not because you got both eyes still. It's not because you don't have stuffing sticking out. It's because you're his. So just receive it and reflect it. And you're going to be golden. Father, I pray for us today. Let us be a church that takes off the jersey and drips with grace and love and compassion. Like you describe yourself in 2 Peter that you are patient with those around you. Let us be that way. For those who might lean in and identify with this personality, with this tendency, I pray that you would help them to uh, just relax, receive, and refocus today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I'm gonna invite our ushers to go ahead and ush as they come forward to help serve us today. I'm gonna encourage you to uh, go ahead and pull out that card. Now, ones, you probably do this every week because that's what we ask you to do. And so you put your name there. Uh, we're encouraging everyone to do that though because this is our opportunity uh, to be able to take next steps. If today you have a specific next step, we have options there on the card. Uh, second thing is this, if you have a prayer request, you wanna uh, connect with any of the events or programs going on. I know we got a ladies night coming up. 
which read the details, it might not be what it sounds, okay? But, but uh, there's, there's all sorts of stuff coming up to connect, okay? Uh, please utilize that card as needed. Um, it's also our opportunity to give back financially here in a moment. If you're joining us online, uh, uh, this is an opportunity for you. If you want to participate, you can go to our website. There's a link there. Uh, whether at the Joplin campus right here at this campus, uh, we can participate in a moment if you came prepared. I know there's lots of ways to give. If you're a guest, zero worries, zero expectations. We're just delighted you're our guest today. So thanks for being here. As a matter of fact, if you let us know, we're going to make a donation in your honor to local high school's food pantry. Now, what we call around here point makers is what we're able to do together. Point makers is all of our giving together. And we take all of our giving and we make everything happen within the programs and the walls of this church and everything outside. And we do things around the world, across the street. One of the things that we like to do is partner with local organizations. And today I want to highlight one of them. I love them. It's Pregnancy Care Center. Pregnancy Care Center is doing amazing things. They're right here in our area. I literally think they're changing what heaven's going to look like by what they're able to do. And today, because of your generosity, uh, just uh, ongoing, we're making a donation to Pregnancy Care Center. We have Danae from Pregnancy Care Center here. She helps with operations uh, there. We want you to know that uh, man, they're making a great uh, uh, impact in this area and that you are helping make organizations like this happen just as, through your generosity through North Point. So uh, Dana will probably be in the lobby. You want to find her. And you'll be able to do so. But I want you to see a video here in a moment when the buckets pass of what Pregnancy Care Center is doing to make an impact and why we're so proud to partner with them. So ushers, go ahead and pass those buckets. As the buckets pass, we put our cards and our giving. See this kind of impact. We first met whenever I had, was taking my buddy over to see his new girlfriend. We were going over there to hang out for a little bit. Turns out that Lydia was actually his girlfriend's roommate. Just met her whenever she came home from work that day and we just kind of hit it off from there. We started talking and found out that we have a lot in common and then we moved in together. We had never really thought about having kids. That wasn't really too much of our plan there. We started feeling what we thought might have been movement and that's when we decided we needed to get a pregnancy test. And so we went and bought a couple over-the-counter ones, took those home. They both came back positive. It was just the two of us. We were living in my dad's basement at the time. It was terrifying. We weren't sure what we were going to do. We didn't know how to even approach my dad about it. We didn't know how to, how to do any of it. We called Pregnancy Care Center because they could help us out with getting an ultrasound done. Keeping him and raising him as our own and everything was our last that was the last choice that we thought of. Um, we were considering every possible route except for that. But then we got to sit down and talk to Lisa and Kim and they just kind of, they just talked to us, explained how, for one, we're not on our own. We thought we were gonna have to do this by ourselves and you don't. I never thought I'd have a baby. The ultrasound and hearing the heartbeat, it really changes everything for you. It's been really amazing to see the journey that Lydia and Hunter have been on from the beginning of when they came to the center to the couple that they are now. You know, Hunter really stepped up with the classes, with educating himself on how to be the best dad he could be. The Care Center really showed us that we can do this and that it's not an impossible thing, that it's not going to stop your life, it's going to change it for the better. It really just helped us through the whole process of being comfortable with going from, it's just you, you're gonna have to figure out how to be parents, to you've got a whole community here for you. Grayson's birthday is in April, and it's been an absolute roller coaster of a year that I'm, I'm so excited to celebrate this first birthday for him, and I can't wait for the next. I wake up every day excited to see him. Well, I hope you found that message helpful and encouraging on your spiritual journey. And for all of us, I know that we have next steps that come with that. I'd encourage you to write those next steps on that connection card. And we'd love to pray with you about that this week. As always, you can follow us on any one of our social media sites. We'll see you next week.